Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I appreciate the fact that we have a church that is going to come and worship no matter what. I mean, you know, if it's flooding out there, I think I'm going to be here just so you know. Just you know, if it's completely you flooded. Been there, done that. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, when it was complete flood, I was the only one here. You're right. Been there, done that. Facebook Live, listen, that's important Sunday, Facebook Live Sunday. If you go Facebook Live, all your friends will see an invitation from you. If you grab the paper in the back, it gives you some ideas too also what to say. Like, tell them you'll meet them. Tell them, you know, hey, if you don't know where it's at, call me. I'll, I'll you know, come get you that morning. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Invite them to, hey, if you want to go get lunch afterwards, let me know. And I'll, you know, catch lunch. Because it's your friends you're inviting, right? So hopefully you want to spend time with your friends and just, you know, spitball in there. But, you know, maybe you want to spend some time with your friends, but invite them. Listen, this could be a day when we have lots of visitors. I'm going to be preaching about friends since we're Facebook friends. And I'm going to give you a clue. I'm going to ask you if you have a Facebook friend here, here that Sunday, right? How many of y'all in this room are Facebook friends with somebody else in this room? Okay, so that means you will be able to raise your hand that day. Okay, when I say, is one of your Facebook friends here? All y'all just raise your hand can already go, yes. You know, but we want some more people. Not because we want to... It's not about having a bunch of people here. It's about telling people about Jesus. And a friend that can stick closer than a brother. So Facebook Sunday is a really important day for us. I hope you'll, you'll plan for that. Missions conference coming up. We're going to do something different this year. Instead of feeding at night each night, we're going to have families take our missionaries out to eat before service. So you can sign up to do that. If like maybe, you know, like, oh, I don't want to take about myself. Get a, you know, you and another couple, take them out. Sign up and do that. Uh, what Javi told me was that many times at missions conference and do it our way, they get to know the staff really well, but they don't get to know people from the church. And I really want to tie into you guys. I get to talk to them other times. You guys don't always get to. So this is an opportunity. We have two missionaries, three nights. So that's six times of people, six families or whatever. If, if you get signed up, maybe, you know, like I said, you can maybe go together for a lot of different reasons, but maybe you just say, hey, there's not a lot of spots left. Let's get two or three families together and take them out that night. Just make sure they're here for service that night. Because if not, you're in trouble. Okay? <laughs> you're around. So you got your Bible, Luke chapter 2 today. You probably have read Luke chapter 2, maybe this week. Maybe you came to our Christmas Eve service and we talked about Luke chapter 2. And you read the story of Jesus' birth and you probably stopped somewhere around verse 19 or 20. Right? He's born, everybody's happy, great, you know. So many times we don't read the rest of Luke chapter 2, which is very important. In Luke chapter 2, two people, a man, a prophetess, and a, a, a prophet and a prophetess come, and they say something about Jesus when he's just born. He's probably eight days old. He's been circumcised, eight days old, and then he's at the temple for the first time. His mother, Mary, offers a sacrifice. If you look back in Leviticus, that's a sin offering, just so you know uh, what she offered. She offered a sin offering. Um, just so you know, when I was in Bible college, um, I had a lady ask me, she was Catholic, and I'm not going after Catholics, it's just, that's who this was. And she said, why don't you pray to Mary? I, now, I haven't talked to a lot of people about religion at all, right? So, I mean, friends, but you know, and I go, well, why would we pray to Mary? And this lady said, well, because she was perfect. I'd never heard that before. I go, Mary's perfect? She goes, yeah, Mary's perfect. I go, how do you know that? And she says, because she had a perfect baby. Okay? So the only way you can have a perfect baby is if you were perfect yourself. Now, let me step back here for a second. Um, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and that's the reason, okay? Anyway, I go, well, then I got a question for you. She goes, what? I go, do you pray to Mary's mom? She goes, what do you mean? I go, well, Mary's perfect, right? She goes, yeah. And I go, and it takes a perfect person to have a perfect baby, right? She goes, yeah. And I go, so her mom must have been perfect. I guess so. And then her mom was perfect. Well, yeah. And then her mom. And then her mom. And her mom. Her mom. And her mom. And eventually you tell me Eve was perfect. Well, that's not how it works. <laughs> See, here's my problem. I'm way too logical. <laughs> and when somebody gives me a problem like that, it's like, this is... You. Anyway, so Mary is here in, in, according, I think it's like 19 or so, 
the two turtle doves is a sin offering that Mary's offering. Okay, so Mary comes, she has Jesus circumcised, she offers sin offering, and then these two people walk up to Mary and she's carrying a baby and they go, Oh, by the way, this baby's special. She goes, I know angel been telling me that, right? And so they start saying stuff. You got your Bible, Luke chapter 2, verse 33. <coughs> Excuse me, I haven't been coughing too bad today, so. Luke 2, 33 says, And Joseph and his mother, Jesus' mother, marveled at those things which were spoken of by him, by Simeon, right? Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That's what we're looking at this morning. What the Bible says, what is trying, what Simeon is really trying to tell us this morning, okay? You got your Bible, you get your outline number one. Which side will you pick? Number one on the outline. Which side will you pick? Read verse the beginning of verse 34 again. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. He's destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. As you read these verses, you first have to identify who we're talking about. And of course we're talking about Jesus because he's prophesying about the baby Jesus there, okay? So of course this verse is about Jesus. But who is the rising and the fall spoken about? It, it, it's, it's awkward how it says it here in English too. It says, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Who is this fall and this rising talking about? Now, me, when I first read this verse, I go, Oh, the rising and the fall of Jesus. Okay? Because remember, he, he, you know, he comes up, he, he doesn't do anything until he's 30 years old. Right? I mean, he teaches at the temple when he's 12. And he does stuff, but his real public ministry does not start until he's 30 years old. Okay? So when it starts, he only had a public ministry for three years. Now, check that out for a second. Stop and think about that for a second. Jesus changed this entire world for eternity, and he only really spent three years preaching and teaching. You would think the influence he had, he spent his whole life, 100 years, teaching. No, no, no. Three years. And in that time, people started following him. And when he came to the end of his life, when he came into Jerusalem... When he entered the city, you know what they were yelling? Hosanna! Hosanna! In, the in other words, the Messiah is here. He's fixing to set up his kingdom. He's fixing to rule in Jerusalem. He's about to kick those Romans out. It's about to be on. You know, he's like, this is awesome. God's coming here. But by the end of that week, you know what they were yelling? Crucify him. Crucify him. In my mind, boy, that's a rising and a fall just like that. You know, that's not what it says. This fallen rising. See, my mind goes to Jesus thinking, man, he, he rose really quick and then he fell really quick. And, you know, he was suddenly proclaimed Hosanna and now he's crucified him. Just like that. But that's not what this is talking about. Read it closer. It says, This child is destined for the fallen rising of many in Israel. You see, this verse is it's saying, uh, it's talking about the Jewish people. Jesus was going to cause many to rise and fall. <coughs> it's talking about people that would follow him or not follow him. They were going to accept him or reject him. But what's unusual is who accepted him and who rejected him. Okay. Now, if you were thinking a, the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be rejected, who would you think was going to reject the Messiah? I would think sinners, people that didn't believe, people that you know were not following him. The non-religious people would reject Jesus. Who do you think is going to follow the Messiah? The religious people, right? You would think the religious people are going to follow the Messiah and the non-religious are going to reject him. But can I tell you, it's totally opposite. The religious people, a few followed him, but most of the religious people rejected him. And the funny thing is, the sinners, the ones he came to say, hey, you're a sinner, were the ones that says, yeah, I want to follow you. But it's like totally backwards of what we as people like, can I tell you something? What we expect things to happen doesn't always happen. And when God tells you to witness to somebody, you need to, because you don't know what God's doing in their life. And you don't know. You might think, oh, it's going to work out this way. But God can flip it on its head just, just like that. So when he tells you to do something, do something. Because he might have something super special in store for you if you just obey. The people here are the backwards. Now, if you read it, I don't know this in the original language, but look how it says it here. It says the child is destined for the fall and rise of the initial. Isn't, isn't that awkward how it states it? Don't we usually put the positive stuff first and the negative stuff second? 
we would say the rising and the fall. The fall and the rising. It's backwards how we would say it. And I think that's apropos since it's backwards by how we thought it would be too. You know, isn't that kind of weird? Like, we would think the religious people that should be looking for the Messiah, that should know the Messiah is coming, would be the ones to say, I'm going to follow the Messiah. But that's not it. The religious rejected him. It was the sinners and those that followed him. You see, we don't get this. Like, it's, it's crazy. You see, the ones that accepted him were not who we thought. Because some did accept him. Some accepted him just you know, like he was. The ones who accepted were the ones who knew they had nothing to offer God. He was the prostitutes, the drunkards, the thieves, the poor, the ones that had nothing to offer God were the ones that accepted Jesus. You see, we get this backwards mentality in our mind, not just in these verses, not just who accepted, but in life we get this backwards mentality of how we should live life. We think life should be about pleasing ourselves. And we think that pleasing ourselves will bring us joy. But can I tell you something? It brings nothing but emptiness. Rich people commit suicide too, you know. People that we say have everything get there and they go, is this it? Is this what life's about? They finally figure out it's not what life's about. I was watching, I was watching, for some reason I've got to watch a lot of YouTube here lately, I don't know. But I was watching uh, two singers from a very terrible band have gotten saved recently. Um, well, I don't know how recently, it was probably a couple years ago by the time I seen it. But, but like, oh, what's the name of the group? It's a really like pretty heavy metal group. And two of them, Brian something, Brian, anyway, uh, two of them got saved, like the bass and the lead singer get saved, start following Jesus. Now, if you were going to pick somebody to get saved, follow Jesus, would it be the lead singer of, of a heavy metal band? No, because we think backwards. We think good people are going to accept Jesus and bad people are going to reject Him. But what you end up finding is it's usually backwards how we think. <coughs> it's the ones that realize they need something. You see, the Pharisees, they thought they had it all. They had it all figured out. <coughs> we've got this thing down now. Our works are good. We've, we've done our works. We don't even need a Messiah because we got it all together. Remember two people went to pray at the, at the temple? One a Pharisee, and he stood and said, Oh God, thank you. I'm not like that sinner over there. Talk about arrogance. You know what I'm saying? God, thank you, I'm not like that guy over here, but I do everything you told me to do, and I follow it. And the other guy stands there and goes, Lord, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. And Jesus said that man went away justified because he came to God asking God for something. The Pharisee went away. He wasn't justified. Why? Because he was telling God how good he was. You see, unfortunately, it's how we are sometimes. We think our actions... Or what's important. Can I tell you something? There is nothing you can do to earn salvation. And many times, we turn this on its head too. Okay, since there's nothing I can do to earn salvation, I shouldn't do anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to follow God. I don't have to be obedient to God. Because I can't earn it. Get your, look in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2. We take this verse and we say, see, I can't earn salvation, so I shouldn't do anything. Two, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation is totally not based in works. So we shouldn't work for God. We shouldn't come to church. We shouldn't do these things. Uh, until you keep reading God's Word, read the very next verse. Look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, we get everything backwards. We think, since I don't work for my salvation, I don't have to work, I don't have to do anything. But God says, once you got saved, you were created for good works. 
Here's the deal. Here's the illustration I give for this. It's a truck and a trailer, right? I have a brother who was moving to Springfield, and he hooked it. Well, U-Haul hooked up a trailer. He was going down 45, and the trailer passed him. Not a good thing. <laughs> you know, when you look over in the trailer, you're pulling. It goes past you. <laughs> Something went wrong, right? You know? And, and here's how I explain it. Salvation is the truck. Our good works is the trailer. We can't do anything to earn our salvation. We just get in the truck and drive it. Okay, we just accept it. But the salvation comes before the works. The works don't save us. I'm teaching Bailey to drive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yesterday we were driving at the middle school in the neighborhood. And so just for a moment I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit. We're going to go in reverse. And I said, now listen, it's much harder to go in reverse than it is to go forward. Can I get an amen from anybody? Okay. Much harder to back up than go straight, go forward. And I said to her, I said, and it's even harder, and I won't teach you how to back a trailer. People that think they're going to earn their salvation are trying to back a trailer through life. It's always messed up. It's always going the wrong way. It, it doesn't work that way. It's much easier to live life pulling the trailer. You get saved first. Your work, good works are what glorify God. In other words, we do this backwards. I, works don't save me, so I don't do any works. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. Works don't save you, but you were created to do good works once you were saved. And, and we mess it up. You see, everyone has to choose. That's what this verse is telling us. Going back into Luke chapter 2. <laughs> Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Everybody in Israel had to make a choice about who Jesus was. Notice that the verse doesn't give a third option. Right? There's only two sides to this coin. It says you're either for the fall or the rising. That's it. You're either choosing to reject him or accept him. That's it. There's no other choice. There's not a third option. Throughout the Bible, this is how it is. You either have to choose to accept Jesus or reject him. And everyone has to decide for themselves about what they think about Jesus. Do you need him as your Savior? Do you need what he did for you? Or do you think what you do is good enough for yourselves? Can we be honest? Don't be honest. Don't say anything out loud. But be honest with yourself this morning. Don't we all know that we're a sinner? Don't we all look at our actions every day? And the funny thing is, some people say, no, I only do good stuff. The Bible says the best we can do is filthy rags to God. Now, here's how I believe in that. Here's how I believe that. The best I can do. Because when I come and I worship God, isn't that good works? And isn't that not filthy rights to God? Well, it depends about your motives. Right? Can we be honest this morning? That sometimes I do what's right because you guys are watching me. And my motives aren't to please God. It's to not look bad to you guys. And aren't you the same way? Don't you do a lot of good things, not because you really want to do them, but because other people are watching you, your kids are watching you. Right? Oh, so-and-so's watching. My wife's watching me, I can't even drink You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so what is that? What does God say? See, that's why our, our actions are filthy right, because they're not even motivated out of <laughs> purity. They're motivated out of selfishness. So that I look good to people. See, that's what it is. Everyone has to choose. And when we say that our works are good enough, we're choosing self over God. But well, we all have to choose. Everyone in Israel had to choose. Anyone who says their works are righteous are Pharisaical. The Pharisee said, my works make me righteous. Can I tell you, your works don't make you righteous because they're probably not even motivated from the right perspective. What makes us righteous is Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin. That we might become the righteous of God in Him. The only way I look righteous is to accept Jesus' righteousness on my behalf. When I stand before God, I'm not going to say, you know what I did. I'm going to say, you know what Jesus did for me. That's all I can do. Number two this morning. He was rejected. Look at verse 34, the end of verse 34. 
It says, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. There's going to be a sign that's against Jesus. <coughs> we, we missed this a little bit because it's, it's kind of confusing. But I want you to picture this for a second. Here's Mary carrying this baby, right? She's carrying the baby through the temple. Anna comes up and prophesies, says something about Jesus. And then Simeon comes up and says something about Jesus, right? And Simeon says, oh, this baby's going to be rejected. Can I ask you a question? Like, when you look at a baby, do you think anybody's going to reject a baby? I mean, a newborn. I mean, this, this baby's 8 to 10 days old. You look at this brand new newborn, and you go, what do you think? Oh, how sweet. <laughs> oh, how innocent. Yeah, whatever. That baby's manipulated you the whole time, I'm telling you. It's hungry, it cries, you give it food. It's got a dirty diet where it cries, you check. you're getting manipulated. I'm just saying. Now, it's not the baby's fault. He needs somebody to take care of him. Him or her needs somebody to take care of him. But anyway, you look at this baby. You know, you look at this baby, and the baby is kind of... We would look at Jesus, the baby Jesus, and we go, who can reject Jesus, right? But he's going to be rejected. But the opposite is also true. Do you realize every convicted killer, every homicidal killer, every Jeffrey Dahmer, every, you know, Nazi, you know, all these people, do you know they were all babies once? They're all cute. And you'd look at them and go, this, this, this child can't grow up to be a monster. You see, we're terrible judges of character. <laughs> we're terrible. We look at the baby and go, oh, how sweet and innocent. That baby will never do anything wrong. And here comes Simeon going, oh, by the way, he's going to cause everybody in Israel to either follow him or reject him. And he's going to make everybody make a choice. He's going to be rejected. And Mary and Joseph are going, my baby's going to be rejected. But it was prophecy what was going to happen. Right? How could they reject such a cute baby? How could this happen? See, it's hard to see evil or goodness in a baby. They're all the same. Every baby's good, but it's just not that way. Simeon prophesied he knew that one of the signs who Jesus was is that he would be rejected. One of the signs from the Old Testament is the Messiah was going to be rejected. How could we reject this child? How could this prediction come true? Well, look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, I'm going to read verses 3 through 6 for you. Listen to what it says. Isaiah, again, hundreds of years before Jesus came, talking about the Messiah, it says, He is despised and rejected by men. Done, right? Like here's prophecy. It's done, but look what it keeps saying about Jesus and the Messiah. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did, esteem, uh, did not esteem him. We didn't think much of him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. We think God was punishing Jesus. And afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6 is probably one of the first complete verses I've ever as a kid. And I'm so glad that was one of the first verses in the Old Testament. All we like sheep. We're all like sheep. You know what that, you know what that verse saying? We're all dumb. We get everything backwards, don't we? That's what we're talking about. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus is going to die for our sins. But listen. You know what that verse is all tells? All we actually have gone astray. We've turned everyone to their own way. We've made everybody choose self over God. That's what our sins have done in this world. Our selfishness, our pride. You see, He wasn't going to be rejected by everyone. Jesus did have some followers, some very faithful followers. But they were few. Huh. His apostles... As soon as they grabbed him, what did the apostles do? 
The Bible tells us there was one apostle, probably I think it was John, who was at the trial. He, he went to the trial. Let's see. Peter was there, but he was kind of just trying to peek in the door and see what he see what he could catch, see what he could hear. And they come to him, oh, you're one of oh no, I'm not. Oh, you're one of his followers. Oh no, I'm not. Not with that guy. You're gonna be kidding me. In fact, Peter cursed to deny Jesus. Hmm. What ended up happening in Israel was a great divide about who Jesus was. You were either strongly for him or strongly against him. There was no, there was no middle ground. You, you were either crying Hosanna and you didn't give that up, or maybe you cried Hosanna and changed, and you were saying crucify him. But Jesus was he, there was no middle ground with him. And the thing is, if you're one of his, if you follow him, you're going to have consequences in your life for following Jesus. We don't like to hear that. As followers of Jesus, we want to think that if we follow Him, everything's going to be perfect. Right? I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? Just not real, but it'd be awesome, you know. We think that, oh, if you follow Jesus, you're following God, so everything's going to be perfect. But this world is not our home. Our home is in heaven. This is Satan, what he controls. And we think it's going to be good. You see, we're going to be rejected too. If you want to be one of those devoted followers, you better expect rejection. Our lives are going to be miserable if we think we can follow Jesus and be popular with this world. If you think the world's going to love you and you're going to love Jesus, you're going to be miserable. Because you can't serve two masters, the Bible tells us. If you choose Jesus, you have to reject the world. But if you choose the world, you can't follow Jesus. It, they're opposites. You can't do both. So you stand here in the middle, choosing when to go on each side, and you're going back and forth, and you're miserable. Because you won't just say, I'm good. see, what we do in American Christianity today is this. Lord, I want to go to heaven, so I'm your follower, but I don't want to do anything you want me to do. I don't want to work. I just want the heaven. I don't want to make you the Lord of my life. I just want to give you a little portion so that I can go to heaven. There's no middle ground. John 15, uh, verses 18 through 20 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. <laughs> He's talking to his followers. He said, listen, if you're following me, understand, the world's going to hate you, but don't worry, it hated me first. Thanks, Jesus. That's a better. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So if you choose to be of the world, yeah, the world's going to love you. But you have no part of Jesus. Keep going. But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You were sitting over here in the world, and Jesus says, I love you, I died for you, I want to give you heaven, I want to forgive your sins. And you go, that is so awesome. He pulls you out of the world onto his side, and he says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers. I want to give you a life more abundantly. And we go, that's awesome. And then we go, but I like some of this over here too. And God says, that's not where the blessings are at. Yeah, there's persecution, there's trial, but there's also blessings, and there's peace and joy. He goes on. I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're all they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. In other words, they are made a choice. And if you're on your side, now listen, when we come to church together, we come to support each other, to encourage each other to live more like Christ. We should love each other. That's what that verse tells us. Here in this church, we should love and care for each other, encourage each other, push each other to good works, the Bible tells us to do. But if we go into the world and we're a follower of Jesus, they probably aren't going to like us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're never going to be in the majority. Can we just believe that and say, God, you're right, and go on? Because when we start expecting what's going to happen, it doesn't hurt as much. Because we expect to be rejected. You know when it hurts is when you think this world's going to love you and they reject you. And if you walk over here and you know I'm about to invite somebody to church, they're going to probably reject me. And then they reject you, you go, well, that's what I thought was going to happen. We shouldn't be cynical about it. We should be obedient to God. But let me tell you something. We have to understand the truth about this world. There's only two sides. What I find in my life is I'm called to love people. And, and this leads me in the overwhelming minority. 
You see, you have religious people who in the name of hating sin, hate sinners. They think they're being religious. They think they're pleasing God by hating sin, but then they end up hating the people that sin. And God said not to do that. He said to love people. Then you have sinners that hate anyone who would call them sinful. You see, I'm in the super minority. I'm called to love the sinner, which causes the religious pious to hate me because I love people even though they're sinners. So the religious people hate me. But I stand against sin, which causes sinners to hate me. I'm in the super minority here. But isn't that what happened at Jesus' time? Who did Jesus go talk to? He went to the prostitutes, the drunk, the thieves, all the, the tax collectors, the rebel. He went to those guys. And what did the religious say to him? Your master goes and hangs out with sinners. He's a drunkard. How can he hang out with it? Listen, if you're going to be righteous, you've got to stay away from sinful people. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't need a doctor, I didn't come for you. I came for people who knew they needed a doctor. That's why these people over here accepted Jesus, because they knew they needed something. They didn't think they had it all to themselves. They didn't think they had all everything that would please God. They knew they couldn't please God. And so here comes somebody who says, hey, I'll do what you can't do. And they're like, dude, I'm on your side. So as you follow Jesus, he tells you to love sinners, which is going to cause other religious people to hate you because you care about people that are lost. But then the people that are lost that you say, hey, you have sin, they hate you because you call them a sinner. And we have Christians that are discouraged because they don't support them. And the Bible says that's what you should expect. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. But if they listen to me, they'll listen to you. So we come out from among them on Sunday morning to encourage each other. To say you're right for loving sinners. But you're right for calling sin, sin. And today, think about today. We have a, man, our, our big, one of our big divides, homosexuality, right? God loves homosexuals. He loves them. He died for them. He gave everything for them. And so I'm supposed to love them. I got religious people telling me that I'm supposed to hate them. But then when I go talk to them, I say, hey, what you're doing is sin. They go, Oh, I hate you because you say what I'm doing is sin. And I stand here in the middle and go, wow. And I didn't expect it. Because I didn't study God's Word. Because I didn't know what He said. If we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to expect to be rejected. That's what this second part For a sign which will be spoken against, He's going to be rejected. He's going to be spoken against, and you're going to be spoken against too if you follow him. Number three, Jesus reveals our thoughts. Now, here is the really crazy part. Look, read verse 35. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Now, he's talking to Mary specifically. It says here, Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, the child is destined for the fall and rise of many of Israel, and a sign will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Now, why is he not talking to Joseph? We never find Joseph at the cross. He passes away apparently before. We don't see Joseph at the cross. Okay? We see Mary at the cross. And what happened to Jesus? How'd they make sure he was dead? They took a sword and pierced his side right up to his ribs. And when your heart stops beating, the water pours out and you're dead. You know, and, and if you... That pericardium, I think it's called, whatever that's like. If you drain the water out of that, you're, you cannot live any longer. So they pierced his side, and water comes out. They said, he's dead. And what the Bible is saying here is, you, you're going to feel that also. When they go up to Jesus and pierce his side, Mary, come on, parents, we know what that's like, don't we? I know exactly what that's like. Because when my kids hurt, I hurt. I'm really weird, y'all knew that, but I'm really weird in the fact that if I see somebody fall, I have a pain to shoot through my body. Anybody else like that? Like, you know, I see somebody fall, I'm like, oh, that hurt, you know. I don't like America's Funniest Home Videos. It's just pain. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, 
I don't know who, who really likes that. I think maybe the kids that watch too many videos where there's killing grow up to like America's Funniest Home Videos, you know what I'm saying? That's what's going on there. But here, he says he's going to hurt you also, but he goes on to say that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This prophecy about Jesus being rejected in all this is going to reveal people's hearts and where they're at. You see, Jesus is the dividing line. There, there are many divide lines in our country right now. I, I love is what's going to get rid of them. But unfortunately, we're nowhere near that. You've got politics. Oh, boy. I've told you all, I'm, I'm watching. I, I'm trying not to make comments in service because I don't think it's right. But, or trying not to. Anyway, um, but I, I've been watching the impeachment stuff. They're all liars. Both sides. Just, you know. Like, the Clinton impeachment, everybody's flip flop And one side goes, look, they flip flop And you're going, yeah, so did you. You know, like, they're all only looking out for themselves. And that's what politics is, looking out for yourself. Look out for number one. And we're divided. What I get upset about is if I go to, I try and watch both sides. I try and watch MSNBC, CNN, all that kind of stuff. And, and then I'll watch Fox. And mainly I go to PBS because it's the most just here's the information. And so I watch these YouTube videos. And when you read the comments of the, the MSNBC, CNN, it's totally Democratic side. They're yelling at Republicans, calling them all kinds of names. And if a Republican gets on there, there is no love, no debate about facts. It's just call each other names as fast as you can. Same thing on Fox, except the other direction. Call each other names as fast as you can. And I'm like, nobody's really debating the actual facts. Because that would be looking into truth. And truth doesn't always slant our way. And, and so we're divided very hard in our country with politics. Gender wars right now. Gender wars. Uh, I, Man, it's, they're just, they're, I don't want to go into all that, but there's lots of stuff going on. That economic status divides us. The haves and the have-nots. Race divides us. We should love each other. We're all from Adam eventually. If you go back far enough, we're all from Adam and Eve, or whoever it was first, we're all from the same, you know, I believe it's Adam and Eve, just so you know. But anyway, um, it all traces back to two people, man and woman. However you cut the, if you believe in evolution, it all traces back to man and woman. We all come from the same. Uh, man, we even look at school attendance. Yeah, last night was the football thing. You know, Ohio State, Clemson, LSU, uh, Oklahoma. You know, we teach our kids, don't like Oklahoma. They're from Oklahoma, you know. But when you're a follower of Jesus, I'll even love people that like Oklahoma sinners. Even though their mascot is talking about going too soon, but we won't go there, you know. But as Christians, these things shouldn't divide us. It's just down truth. Politics, oh, man, we fight over Ford versus Chevy. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, like, let me tell you something. I don't care if you drive a Hyundai, a Chevy, a Ford, a Dodge, a whatever is out accurate, whatever. You can drive whatever car, and I'm gonna love you, okay? I might think something weird about you, but I'm gonna love you, okay? I'm just told I gotta love. But we divide ourselves in all these kind of things in America, even in churches, and different people. We divide ourselves, but as Christians. We have something bigger that should bring us together, and that's following Jesus. You see, that's more important than your politics. That's more important than the car you drive. That's more important than your gender. That's more important than your race. That's more important than your economic status. That's more important than the school you attended. Following Jesus is who you are. I'm a Jesus follower. He tells me to love people. He tells me to love people who aren't Jesus followers. But being a Jesus follower should change us. To the world, Jesus is a huge divider. But following Jesus means you give things up. That's why they don't like it. See, if we follow Jesus and we really follow His Word, we no longer live lives for ourselves. We're trying not to live a selfish life. In fact, we're living a life to please Him and do what He says. And people don't like that. They don't like being told they're selfish. They don't like being told they're wrong. But we say, hey, you're supposed to live for Him. He tells us we should 
what should be important in our lives. In other words, we don't get to choose what's important in our lives anymore for followers of Jesus. He tells us what's important. And too many times we think money's important, and God says that's not what it's about. But let me tell you something. There is absolutely nothing wrong with saving money. In fact, I think you should save money. We've done Dave Ramsey here. You know, you should have six months. You should have retirement. You should have all the savings. I am totally for saving money. But here's the real truth. Where does your, where does your trust come in? Does your trust come in your bank account or your God? Some people trust their bank account, and God makes it disappear so they learn to trust Him. Right? But if you really trust Him, you can save and know that that money can be gone tomorrow. Ask people that retired around 2008 to 2012. Be going like that. Just right? What Jesus does is he reveals our motives. He reveals our motives. Do we live a life to please and satisfy ourselves, or do we have a higher purpose for our lives? What's the purpose for your life? The question becomes for each one of us: what is your purpose? Now listen, your purpose will reveal your motives. The perp if you have a purpose, it will change your motives. When you understand the purpose of your lives, you can understand why you do what you do. If the purpose of your life is to get rich, you're going to understand why you work way too many hours. Because you're trying to get rich. That's what it takes to get rich. You're going to understand why you don't spend on anything. The funny thing is rich people don't spend money. They put it in the bank. And everybody that's poor thinks, I want to be rich so I can spend a lot of money. But to be rich, you can't spend a lot of money. It's like a catch-22. If you want to be rich, you can't spend money. But you want to be rich so you can spend money. It doesn't work that way. What I really find, and this is true, is poor people will help other poor people before rich people will help other poor people. You go to places, and somebody goes, oh, man, I need something. Somebody that is poor will walk in the house and say, oh, here you go. Here's what you need. Because they're not invested in riches. Uh, rich people go, oh, I can't give my stuff away. This is mine. The motives. What are we living life for? You see, what God's really wanting us to live for, He wants us to live a life that pleases Him. What American Christianity is missing today is saying, Jesus, God, You are the Master, the Lord of my life. My life is here to please You, whatever that means. Because most Christians are there to please themselves. They follow Jesus because it leads to heaven. It's what they're getting. But a real follower of Jesus says what Jesus says, Father, not my will, but thine be done. That's what a real follower of God is. He says, God, it's not about me, it's about you. If your motive is to please God, you're going to study his word. And I, I get it. We're not all like love to sit down and say, I, Really, honestly, I'm not a person that just likes to sit down and study God's Word. I study God's Word for a reason. In other words, somebody comes to me and asks me a question. I'll start studying God's Word about what that is. I'm getting ready for Sunday. Today, I study God's Word to, to check what it says, to make sure I know what God's Word says. Some of you guys don't study for... It's just not you to study just for any... You know, like, i got five minutes. Let me go study John 15. You know, it's just not your life. And, and Peter was that way, right? Peter was asked first, asked questions later. They're coming to get Jesus. He pulls out a sword and starts chopping people. You know? And Jesus says, Peter, put your sword away. He lives by the sword. He picks up his ear and he heals him. Put your sword away. But Paul, on the other hand, was the one that went and reasoned. Right? He went to Mars Hill and says, let's reason. He knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. That's how he grew up. And he said, I can prove to you from the Old Testament that Jesus the Messiah. He would sit down and he'd reason with them. And prove to them. Now, Peter and Paul are two opposite, per polar opposite personalities. Act first, think about it later. Think about it, talk about it, maybe act in the end. Right? But they both serve God. In fact, they both probably gave their lives for God. We know Paul did. Because they both, their motives are the same. So, if you really love God, maybe studying it is not your, your thing, but you still need to study it some. Okay, you still need to study God's Word. Maybe you can't memorize real easy, but you still need This It says, Thy Word have I hid in my heart, Thou am I not sin against thee. You still need to memorize it. But maybe you're the action person, and you can invite, when I was a youth pastor, we would have teams, and they would just 
They'd be able to invite. They'd be able to bring 10, 15 people to an activity just like that. Maybe that's you. You're the action person. Listen, when you decide what your motives are, if my motives are to follow God, my actions are going to be dictated by my motives. Listen what it says. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus reveals your motives. He reveals what your life is really about. And He does it by looking at His Word. And it's a mirror. It shows us who we are. You see, you can't say you love God and you want to give Him your life and yet be selfish. Again, there's nothing wrong with saving for retirement. I think you should. I do. I, I'm just, I save for retirement. I've been saving for, my, for retirement since I got out of college. Because I think it's a, you know, you save a little bit for a long time, it's a lot better than saving a lot at the end. You know, it just doesn't do much good. But it comes down to a question again. If God reveals your motives, you know what he's trying to make you do? He's trying to ask you the question, which side will you pick? Which side are you going to pick? You see, we've talked about the same thing from many different angles today. We've talked about the same thing over and over it all comes down to the prophecy by Simeon. Think about it. The rise and fall of many people of Israel. Israel had to choose what side to be on. Either Jesus, either rejecting or accepting. And a sign which would be spoken against. Rejection divides Christians even, if they're going to really follow God or not. It divides people in this world. Listen, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to have to be rejected. I don't want it. it rejection divides us. The thoughts of, of our hearts divides us. Our motives divide us. You see, all what we've been talking about today, all this prophecy, is about choosing a side for you, if you're going to choose Jesus' side or not. All of, all of these thoughts lead to a question. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Do you choose the fall going away from Jesus? The majority, so you have lots of friends and you're not rejected. We have to reject Jesus? Or do you choose the rising and go towards Jesus but to be in the minority? Except Jesus is your son. See, we all come to this choice in our life. I believe that's what the tribulation is about. They're going to be in that time choosing their Jesus. Now, they're going to know by the end of the tribulation God's doing something. Ain't no, you read the book of Revelation. Ain't no way by the end of that they're not going, this is God's word. I believe the whole point of the tribulation is to make people choose. By the end of that seven years, you're going to choose which side you're on. But what Jesus did was he makes us choose. This prophecy was about Jesus making people choose a side. It's kind of scary to think if you were at the cross of Jesus. If you were there and they said, should we release Barabbas or Jesus, what would you do? You see, the Pharisees were getting all the people, hey, if you want, to, if you want some influence, yell to let Barabbas go. And the Pharisees were manipulating people to reject Jesus. That's what the majority does. And they got the majority to reject Jesus. And he says, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And the Pharisees got up to yell, crucify him. Crucify him. And the majority... Jesus. Here's the question. What side of the cross are you standing on? Are you standing on the side of the El Hosanna? Or are you standing on the side of the El Crucify? See, you have to choose. There's only two options. Either for Jesus or against Him. Are you going to heaven or to hell? There's only two options. Even these verses said there's only two options. What is your choice this morning? Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. I want to tell you about a, a, a God who loves you so much that He would come and die in your place. Because He doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants to give you forgiveness. So He says this, I will live a perfect life and I will tell God that my righteousness is yours and I will take your punishment. That's what Jesus did. He did a few different. He did for anybody who would accept Him. But you have to choose. You have to choose giving your life up and saying, God, you're the Lord of my life. I'm going to do what you do. You have to choose to understand you're going to be the minority and people are not going to understand why we do that. They think we're crazy. Some of us are, but you know. 
What's your choice today? Choose to accept Jesus or reject him. If you choose to accept him and you've never made that public profession, we want to invite you to come here just a moment. Tell people you're accepting Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe you're here and you know he's your Savior, but you haven't been living for him. You're trying to live in the middle. It just doesn't work. You're miserable. Trying to be popular with the world, but yet go to heaven with God. Popular and angry. It's this tug of war back and forth in their life. Can I tell you something? God reveals our hearts. We need to say, God, I believe what your word says that that leads to destruction. So I'm going to be on your side. I'm 100%. What's your choice? Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you feel led to give to the ministries of Cypress Creek Baptist Church, it's quick and easy. You can go to cypresscreekbaptist.org and click on the Give button. Thank you and may God bless you as you serve Him.